Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Ellie Martin. I'm going to talk about uh, rapid mapping of high free fields using a planar hard dielectric fabric Perry interferometer. Um, so just a quick introduction. So um, in high intensity focused ultrasound fields, the beam is very tightly focused down to a small um, into a small region so that we can um, pinch tissue and um, induce cavitation um, so to ablate the tissue. So in the focus of these kind of fields, um, extremely high pressures are induced, so maybe from 10 megapascals, possibly up to 100 megapascals in water. Um, and we also get high temperatures and mechanical effects induced. Um, so as the last speaker said, it's very important to be able to measure these fields. Um, measurement is essential for characterization of um, clinical fields so we can monitor the stability of clinical systems. So this is very well established for radiotherapy, for example, where we have um, daily checks, weekly checks, monthly checks to ensure the stability. Um, we also want to be able to measure these uh, fields for um, validation of um, computational models which we can use for treatment planning. Um, so measurement under these extreme conditions is extremely challenging. Um, so there are very few sensors available which can withstand the high pressures, high temperatures, and cavitation that are in, which are induced. So on the left here, we have um, a photo of a hydrophone, um, and you can see that the electrodes have been eroded away. And this is the kind of thing that can happen. Um, so if we were to be able to do this, then what kind of sensor would we need? Um, so the sensor would have to be robust, first of all, so it could withstand the extreme conditions. It would need to have a wide bandwidth um, so that we could capture all the harmonics that we generated in the focus of the field. Um, a small element size so that we can um, avoid spatial averaging in the very tight focal region. Um, a high dynamic range so that we can measure the high pressures in the focus and the lower pressures elsewhere in the field. Um, and it should also be fast. So if we want to do these kind of measurements routinely, um, you know, day after day, uh, we don't want to be spending 12 hours doing a hydrophone scan, so we'd like it to be quick. Um, so many of the existing sensors um, are limited by their damage threshold, first of all, so this might be 10 or possibly 20 megapascals, um, and also the linearity of the electronic components in the system, so they're often designed to work up to these kind of 10 megapascal limits. Um, there are some robust PVDF hydrophones available, but they tend to have large element sizes, so this is also limiting, um, and some of the sensors that are available, um, which can withstand high pressures, um, have quite high noise levels. Um, so in this work, we used um, a fabri perio interferometer based sensor to measure the pressure. Um, so the interferometer is formed from two parallel mirrors, which are separated by a spacer. Um, the, we use a laser interrogation beam um, to, to read out the sensor. Um, so this light is incident on the interferometer and is multiply reflected between the mirrors. Um, and then these multiple beams interfere as they leave the sensor again at the bottom. Um, so modulation of the thickness of the spacer by the acoustic field causes a phase shift in the reflected light, um, and then this is seen as a change in the reflected optical power measured by a photodiode. Um, so the interferometer transfer function um, is the relationship between the optimum, um, between the phase um, and the reflected optical power. Um, so we tune the wavelength of the interrogation laser to the maximum gradient of this function here. Um, so that for a given pressure change, we get the maximum change in the optical, in the reflected optical power. Um, and in this way, we maximize the sensitivity of the sensor. Um, so we can also uh, tune the power of the interrogation laser so that we can optimize the signal for the pressure range that we're measuring. Um, so the signal at the photodiode is, um, uh, depends on the, the product of the sensitivity of the system, the acoustic power that we're measuring, um, and the optical power of the interrogation beam. Um, so if we adjust the optical power, then we can scale the voltage to within the limits of the photodiode and maximize the sensitivity again. Um, so the, the choice of materials that you choose for the interferometer um, will affect its properties, so the noise levels, the dynamic range, the sensitivity. Um, so this can be chosen to suit the application. So for example, in photoacoustic imaging, where we're trying to measure very, very small amplitude signals with very low noise, um, we can choose the spacer thickness and the materials so that to minimize
minimize the noise levels so that this can be done. Um, and then you can make a slightly different choice of materials so that you can measure um, ultrasound fields. Um, so this has also been done. So in this work, um, we wanted the sensor to be robust um, and to have all these provide dynamic range and um, low noise levels. So we chose a hard dielectric construction. So the sensor in this case is formed from a wedge glass substrate um, with mirrors formed from alternate layers of silicon dioxide and zirconium dioxide um, applied by an electron beam evaporation to the glass substrate. And then there's a spacer, um, a three micron silicon dioxide spacer, and then another set of mirrors on the top. Um, so this, these materials and the construction give the, um, the sensor high dynamic range, so it should be linear up to about 70 megapascals. Um, it has a flat frequency response up to hundreds of megahertz, um, which is, we've seen demonstrated by measurements of um, very wide width bandwidth um, pulses and based on the model as well. Um, the element size is optically defined in this case by the laser spot size, um, which here is 25 microns. Um, and waveforms can be acquired from 200 different positions on the sensor per second, so it's extremely rapid as well. Um, so the experimental setup then. So we have um, a water bath with the sensor mounted in the bottom. Um, the high through transducer is mounted pointing downwards so that the beam is instant on the sensor. Um, and the optics here are underneath, so there's a galvo mirror here which um, moves to scan the laser beam across the sensor to interrogate it. Um, and then we have um, another transducer which we use for monitoring for cavitation. Um, so this is what it looked like in the lab. So the optics are underneath here, the transducer mounted at the top, um, and the transducer pointing down at the sensor, which is underneath here. Um, the bath was temperature controlled um, by this radiator here. Okay, so the acoustic field in this case um, that we mapped was produced by a single element, very focused transducer from Sonic Concepts, um, and we drove this at 1.1 and 3.2 megahertz um, using a four cycle burst, um, and then recorded the time varying pressure at each of the scan points. Um, and all of these um, scans that I'm about to show you were done in single shot mode, so there was no averaging done whatsoever. Um, so, first of all, we did a pressure calibration. So um, we did this by taking scans of a, a pulse plane piston check source um, at each of the interrogation laser powers and then compared this with um, measurements made using a calibrated hydrophone with scanning tent. Um, and we just take this one um, value of the pressure from the check source um, and use that as a scaling factor for the flat frequency response. Um, okay, so these are some spatial maps. Sorry, they're not. Um, so hopefully they will start playing in a second. Um, so these are spatial maps of the peak positive and peak negative pressures um, that were taken at different scan planes, scanning from a few millimeters either side of the transducer, um, of the focal plane of the transducer. Um, and they were done with a 50 micron set of 100 by 100 um, scan points. So each of these planes was acquired in 50 seconds. Um, so. Sorry, it doesn't. The computer seems to be struggling here. Okay, let's move on to these ones. Um, so these are focal waveforms. So they're just snapshots from the focus of this field um, at different drive voltages. Let's see if I can play them straight from the stick.
Um, no, I'm sorry, they're not going to play. Um, okay, so these are just basically showing the waveforms increasing in amplitude. Um, so we increase the drive voltage, we keep increasing it until um, the waveform on the left becomes increasingly nonlinear and high pressure, and then on the right we can see many harmonics being generated in the spectrum. Sorry, we need to be not going to connect. Okay. Um, so this is um, just a plot then of the drive voltage. Um, so drive voltage along the bottom is increasing, um, and the pressure increasing on the left. So as we um, increase the drive voltage, the peak positive pressure and the peak negative pressure are increasing, and we manage to measure pressures, um, peak positive pressures up to 49 megapascals, and peak negative pressures to 14 megapascals. So these are extremely high pressures. Um, and the waveforms have, you know, little noise. Um, so as we increased the pressure, the drive level above this, um, we saw cavitation occurring. Um, so we stopped increasing the drive level at this point. Um, but there was no evidence of damage to the sensor. Um, so it could still be used again afterwards. There wasn't a change in sensitivity. Okay, so these are just some snapshots then of the high pressure waveform. So on the left here, we have a snapshot of the focal waveform. So this is with increasing drive voltage going down here. Um, so you can see the waveform becoming increasingly nonlinear um, and more harmonics are generated. Um, so these are just line scans across um, some of the planar scans. Um, so you can see that as the drive voltage increases, the, um, the peak positive pressure is becoming increasingly larger and narrower compared to the peak negative pressure. Um, and each of these lines would have taken approximately one second to acquire. Um, okay, so just a word about the noise as well. Um, so here we have a plot of the noise equivalent pressure um, against the maximum pressure that we could measure on each of those different interrogation laser power ranges. Um, so it's scalable with that interrogation laser power. Um, and on the left here, um, I've shown the kind of typical noise level from the 75 micron PPS needle hydrophone. Um, so that's about 50 kilopascals, which is comparable to the noise at the lower end um, of our measurement range. Um, but obviously, this hydrophone is restricted to this measurement range. Um, and then it increases with the maximum possible measure measurable pressure. Um, and if we compare that to a clean tip, um, fiber optic hydrophone, which is able to withstand these kind of pressures as well. Um, this has a constant noise level of about half a megapascal, so this is much higher than our noise level here. Um, okay, so in summary, we applied um, a planar Fabry Perry sensor to mapping of the high field fields at high pressures. Um, so we measured positive pressures at 49 megapascals and peak negative pressures at 14 megapascals. Um, over scan areas of 20 by 20 millimeters. So the sensor is robust, it has a wide bandwidth, um, a high dynamic range, and a small element size. And scan is, scanning is extremely rapid. So these planes were taken in approximately 50 seconds. Um, so if you compare that with a four to eight hours with acquiring a hydrophone scan of the same size, then it's extremely rapid. So in the future, we'd like to compare these pressures against hydrophone scans and perform volumetric mapping of clinical sources. Um, thanks very much. <laughs>